We have a wonderful opportunity to make a real difference in the world through Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday is a global day of charitable giving that serves as a way to kick off the holiday season with a focus on generosity instead of consumerism. First off, in El Salvador, we partner with an organization called One at a Time. For just $100, one at a time creates water filters that can last up to 10 years. South Hills has provided water filters for 160 families in El Salvador so far. But we don't stop there. We connect these families with a local church in El Salvador called We Are Heaven. Now let's shift our focus to a project with an organization called Tumaini in Kenya. This remarkable nonprofit organization conducts essential ministries like running a school, providing employment opportunities, they plant churches. Tumaini is currently raising funds to construct a $6 million hospital in Kenya, which will make a substantial impact on the region's healthcare. So far, they've raised $2 million, and I believe our contributions can make a significant difference in bridging the gap and bringing this vital hospital to fruition. Tumaini has been a great partner for South Hills. They are how we have a global campus in Kenya. And through our global campus, we continue to serve that community. This year, we wanna sponsor 100 kids in that community to have a Christmas. And all it takes is $20 to provide a Christmas for each child. Through this Giving Tuesday, we are gonna be meeting some amazing needs in people's lives. Everything you contribute to Above and Beyond from Sunday, November 26th through Tuesday, November 28th will go directly towards these remarkable initiatives, providing clean water and access to healthcare, education, and a journey of faith. Together, we can continue to make a profound impact in people's lives. I can quit whenever I want. I wouldn't even call my thing an addiction. It's just something I do. And it relaxes me. It's not like it's hurting anymore. Is it the best thing for me? Maybe not. But I can quit whenever I want. We're wrapping up our series today that we've been in where we've been looking at the excuses that we make to avoid our everyday addictions. And last week we learned that um, the things that have more control over us than we do, it, it blinds us to the damage uh, that it's causing to the people around us. And we talked about how it's important for us to recognize how our uh, addictions have affected negatively the people around us, to apologize to them, to ask how we can make it right moving forward, that making amends is about restoration, not retribution. And if you're taking notes, the title of our message as we wrap up this series is, it hasn't been an issue for a while, I think I'm over it. It hasn't been an issue for a while. I think I'm over it. Let me pray for us before we get into the message today. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. And I pray that you would speak to us. Speak to us what we need to hear today. God, I thank you that uh, the Bible tells us that your word is a lamp unto our feet, light into our path. I pray that's exactly what it would be for us today. And whether you're in the room or watching online, if you would just pray this with me, God, if you speak, I'll listen. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Uh, also, real quick, my mom is here today. Um, and uh, yeah. Which is why I don't have any holes in my pants. Done like that. So, and I got all my tattoos covered up. Just to honor her. And um, she didn't want to have a conversation later. That's all. Um, anyone ever uh, have a... Um, like a, a habit that you knew was unhealthy for you and, uh, and you got to a point where you recognized how bad it was and so you said, you know what, 
maybe it got to the point where you were so frustrated with it that you're like, I gotta stop. And you know what? I'm never going back to it. Anybody ever have to? We probably all have things like that, right? I don't want us just thinking about big things, right? It can be anything, right? For me, one of the things I realized was a problem was um, I moved to South Florida, West Palm Beach, to work at a church. And it was the first time that I was living in a different state than my family. So my family really wasn't in like driving distance. And so um, this was the first time that I felt like I was really, really, really on my own. And, um, and so um, I'm not a cook. Um, I don't try to be a cook. Um, I can make you a mean bowl of cereal. Excellent at that. Um, and very few things. And so being on my own, it was like, it's like what, do I, what do I eat? What do I do for food? How do people do this every day? All right? And so um, I remember there was a period early on where, I mean, I was like eating out every single meal. Like on the way to work, I'm getting breakfast. While I'm at work, I'm going out to get lunch. And on the way home from work, I'm picking up dinner. Right? And what I realized very quickly is how unhealthy, not only for me physically, but uh, also for my budget, right? How many of you have ever started to do your budget and you're calculating your expenses and you know you still got a lot of other expenses that you haven't even added in and you're still, you're already in the red, right? That's when you know it's like danger. And so I decided to say, okay, well, how much am I spending eating out? Like, let me just do the math. When you actually do the math on that stuff, it is terrifying. And so I did the math and I was like, something's got to change. I got to figure this out. And so um, I'm trying to like look up like YouTube videos of how to cook simple things, right? I'm the guy who took a frozen chicken breast and just threw it in a hot skillet, didn't realize you had to thaw it out. Um, anybody else do that? Can you make me feel better about myself? Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, uh, that's how bad it was, right? But I got into a rhythm where I could make a couple things, um, easy things. Like my mom, she you know, showed me how to use a rice cooker, so I knew how to make rice. And growing up, we ate rice with every meal. It was rice and meat and maybe some vegetables. And so I could do that. And, um, and so I knew how to do about three things really well. And, uh, and I got in a good rhythm, right? It was like three months where I limited the number of times that I was eating out to about three times a week, which is pretty good. I think that's pretty good. Right? Being single, I think it's great. And, uh, and so I was in this rhythm. It was great. And then, you know, you have that one day. You have that one day where maybe it was a terrible day at work. Maybe you're just tired, right? And as you're driving home from work, you drive by the McDonald's and you're like, man, it would be so much easier to just pull into this drive through and get me something that I love, right? And then you drive by the Wendy's and it's like, oh my gosh, it'd be so easy to pull in and get a Frosty and some French fries. And then you drive by the Burger King, and it's like, oh, my gosh, it'd be so easy to go get a Whopper right now. And then you drive by Chick-fil-A, and it's like, God just spoke to me. This is my dinner, right? And you have that one day. All it takes is one moment. And it completely derails you, right? This happens because breaking any unhealthy habit is really hard, right? Maybe for you, it's, you know what? I'm going to quit flirting with people at the gym behind my spouse's back. Maybe for you, it's, I'm going to stop overspending um, and using my credit card online, right? Maybe for you, it's, I'm not going to allow myself to get angry, right? When I'm lobbying for my ideas at work anymore, whatever it is, we've all hit pain points that cause us to swear certain things off. Right? Maybe you've actually confessed it to someone, you've taken action, right? and, and you've got some accountability, and you started to experience some level of freedom as a result of it. And I guarantee you, when you experience that little bit of freedom from that thing that has more control over you than you do it, you feel better. right? And you can see how it positively benefits the people around you. Right? And, and, and you, you, then you start to tell yourself, you know what, I'm never going back to that. Right? I've experienced some freedom. I'm never going back to that. And you mean it. Right? And you don't go back to it until you do. Some of us end up being so vocal about our recovery that it's hard to actually admit when we relapse. And now we're back doing what we did before, feeling twice as bad and maybe holding on to a greater secret that we can't unburden. The reality and all of us need to understand this. With anything that has more control over us than we do it, the reality is that most people in recovery relapse at some point. Most people relapse at some point. 
And usually what happens when that happens, it's the point at which people are most likely to realize that and be convinced that they never will go back to it. That's the point at which they relapse, is the moment they start to think, you know what, I'm good. It's never gonna happen again. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. He says this, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. Our overconfidence convinces us to let go of all the things that actually helped us to get free. And the problem is when all the structure is gone, when all of the rhythms are gone, when all the accountability is gone, we're unable to stay free. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. When we stop doing the things that allow us to experience freedom, it's unlikely we will stay free. Right? That's not rocket science. It's just truth and it's just fact. Right? When you stop doing the things that are getting you healthy, that are pushing you towards wholeness, you will stop experiencing health and wholeness. Right? And this can be frustrating because if you're like me, you just want to conquer uh, the things that you're trying to conquer and overcome in your life once and for all. You just want to conquer it one time and be done with it. Right? And the frustration can get to the point where we start to think that maybe if I was more spiritual, Right? Maybe if God loved me more, or maybe where you're at in your journey, whether you're in the room or watching online, maybe you're, here, you're saying, man, uh, if God is real, why would he cause me to struggle with this thing? If God is real and he really loved me, why wouldn't he just get rid of this thing that I'm struggling with? Anyone ever found themselves yelling at God just to fix all of your issues at one time? Right? God, I know you can do it. Just do it. Right, look at what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 b through 8. It says this, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Verse 8, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Here's, Paul is like one of those, I don't really know if this is a thing, but like Paul is like considered a legendary Christian. Right? People aspire to have the kind of faith and, and, and live the kind of life that Paul lived, that we see in the Bible. And here he goes saying, you know what? In order to not become proud, to remain humble, I've been given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan that's going to torment me. And I begged and I pleaded with God, God, would you just take it away? We don't know what Paul's thing is or was. Just like I don't know what your thing is, but he describes it as a thorn. I tend to think of it more of like a splinter, right? That little sliver of wood that maybe gets stuck in your finger or up under your fingernail. And it's so small, but it's also so painful at times. And we can go through our life with it, but it makes so much of what we're doing unenjoyable. It starts to steal our focus, our attention, and we work around it, but we become angry at it, right? Some scholars tend to think that Paul's thorn was depression or mental illness. Other scholars think that it was a problem with his eyesight or arthritis, while another group of scholars believe that um, his, his, his thorn was anger issues directed at certain types of people. We don't know what Paul's thing was, but we do know what our thing is if we get honest with ourselves. And we tend to say to God the same exact thing that Paul says to God. Take it away. God, don't you know that I love you? You know I don't want to suffer. You know how hard I'm trying, and I know you can do miracles. Can you just make it go away forever? But look at God's response. Verse 9a, it says this. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. In other words, God's response to us is, and to Paul is, I'm not gonna get rid of it, but I will give you the grace to continue to struggle against it. All right, and this is good news because what this tells us is it's not about becoming perfect and not having any issues that we struggle with, but God says, you know what? I'm gonna give you the grace that you need every single day to wrestle with this thing. You're good, I'm gonna cover you. That's what he's telling us. And maybe you felt like God has responded to you this way before. I know he has with me. And can I tell you in those moments, I'm like, well, God, I will pass on the grace. God, God don't give me the grace. God, if you're going to get rid of this thing forever. If it's, those are my options. God, I don't want your grace. But if I don't want God's grace, can I tell you what else that means? 
that means that really is there forgiveness without his grace in my life. Because it's not just about not having the grace so I can experience freedom, but it's his grace that is sufficient for my sin, not just my addictions. Because eating out more than I should is not a sin. It's not a bad thing. Can it be unhealthy for me? Yes. And I don't want to just say, God, help me overcome that thing that's not really sin if it means that then I don't get the grace when it comes to my sin and my shame. But many of us, if we're honest, we say, God, like, I will pa gladly pass on the grace if you take this thing away from me. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Just because you've gotten free from something doesn't mean you still don't have to fight it. Just because you've gotten free from something doesn't mean you still don't have to fight it. I don't, I don't know how much you know about um, AA, but you've probably seen this much in movies or TV shows. The, the way every person starts their share time is they say, hi, my name is JR and I'm an, I'm an alcoholic. They say, I'm an alcoholic. All right, and they say, my last drink was such and such time ago. Notice that it's, it's not that, they don't say I used to be an alcoholic. They don't say I was an alcoholic. They say I am an alcoholic, right? And the reason this is such an important thing for us to understand is what that communicates to us is, well, you know what? I happen to be winning the fight right now, but the reason I'm winning the fight right now is because I'm fighting. The reason I'm winning the fight right now is because I'm still fighting, and many of us, we get tired of fighting, and we let our guard down, and even the godliest people you know are not above this. The people that you believe are closest to God, can I tell you, they are not above this. And we see this in the life and story of David, right? David, who's seen as this incredible figure in the Bible, right? And David was just a simple shepherd who was anointed to be king at a young age, even though he didn't come from a royal line. And he proved to be a mighty warrior as a young adult and eventually became what most consider to be the greatest king in Israel's history, he wasn't perfect and he definitely had his flaws, but he was able to keep them hidden for a long time. This is because many of our weaknesses are actually overdeveloped strengths. What I mean by that is we have these things that help us, but when we start to rely on them too much, they actually become a weakness for us. For example, David was incredibly brave, so brave that he would say yes to any challenge that had insurmountable odds. Right? And that is an admirable thing. It's a, it's a great strength to have that he was so brave. And we saw the benefits of David's bravery, right? Like the moment where he took his slingshot and he went out and he killed a giant named Goliath, right? Who was threatening the army all on his own. And moments like that uh, were not the exception in David's life. They became the rule. And part of the prize for defeating Goliath was that David would then get to marry the princess. But then the current king, Saul, he had second thoughts. And he gives David an impossible challenge to complete, to earn his bride, because he knew David would say yes to it. He knew David's mentality. And the reason Saul gives David this challenge is he actually believes that David's going to die in this battle. And ultimately, we come to learn that's ultimately what Saul wants. Look at what 1 Samuel 18, 25 through 27, it says this. He told them, tell David that all I want for the bride price is 100 Philistine foreskins. Vengeance on my enemies is all I really want. But what Saul had in mind was that David would be killed in the fight. David was delighted to accept the offer. Before the time limit expired, he and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. Then David fulfilled the king's requirement by presenting all their foreskins to him. So Saul gave his daughter Michal to David to be his wife. Now, while some of us may be a little disgusted and weirded out by King Saul's request, David was excited because fighting was what he excelled at. He knew he was good. He knew without a shadow of a doubt that he could go do what Saul wanted him to do. The violence required for this request did not phase David. And so he's able to defeat the army, he wins his wife, but this trade of his didn't always work out well. And I think David's addiction, his obsession, the thing that had more control over David than he did it was power, right? David, his, his addiction was power, and it was his desire to just get whatever he wanted, even if he had to use force to get it. 
And that's not always the best, smartest, or most godly option, and it still isn't. And David comes to realize this. At one point, David was on the run, hiding with his men in the countryside from Saul, who was jealous of David and wanted him dead. And the men David was hiding with, they were sort of like hired security for ranchers and farmers, and they accepted payment in the form of food. And keep in mind, everybody knows who David is, right? He's a famous war hero, so he tells one rancher, hey, we've been protecting this land, this place for a while, can you feed my men? Because he knows that's how I have to pay them. And this was the rancher's reply. Look at what 1 Samuel 25, 10 through 11, it says this. Who is this fellow, David? Nabal sneered to the young men. Who does this son of Jesse think he is? There are lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. Should I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've slaughtered from my shears and give it to a band of outlaws who, who come from who knows where? And so this guy is clearly and intentionally insulting David, and David, he takes it personally. Look at what verses 12 through 13 says. It says, so David's young men returned and told him what Nabal had said. Get your swords, was David's reply as he strapped on his own. Now, many of us look at this and we say, man, David's kind of overreacting. But when normalcy in your life is, you know what? Hey, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go kill these guys and bring me back 100 foreskins. When that is normal for you, it dilutes your ability to even estimate what type of proper reaction you should have to anything. And this was David's typical way of responding to things. Whether it's the right response or not, David wants what he wants, and if he has to use force to get it, he will. And that's why he responds this way, right? And fortunately, someone gets to him before things get way out of control, And they get him to zoom out and see the bigger picture. He then begins to incorporate this sort of contemplative style into his life and into his way of thinking, right? Look at what Psalm 16, verses one through four, it says this, keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. The godly people in the land are my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak the names of their gods. This is the same guy who just said after uh, Nabal is insulting him, hey, strap up, let's go. This is the same guy. This is the same exact guy. And so we see all of a sudden this shift. Right, And I, I want to just kind of give you an idea of what this is looking like uh, verse by verse here. Verse 1, he says, keep me safe. What he's saying is, you know what, God, I'm going to go to you instead of trying to do this on my own. I'm going to go to you instead of trying to do it all by myself. Verse 2, he says, I'll submit to your will above my own. The good things in my life are all the result of trusting you as opposed to doing whatever I want to do. Verse 3 Everyone I look up to is godly, and that's who I want to be. If I want to continue to be and experience the freedom from the things that have more control over me than I do it, I got to get around some people who've experienced that freedom, who will champion my journey in pursuit of that freedom, right? I got to get around some godly people. Verse 4, when people elevate anything above God, including their way of doing things, it never turns out well. I know we've heard that song by Carrie Underwood, Jesus Take the Wheel. And I wish that would become something that we actually live by. Because we know, we've all probably in this room, whether you're watching online, we've all probably had moments where we've tried to do something our own way versus God's way. And we can be honest about the fact that it probably didn't turn out the way we hoped it would. And then we've had moments in our life where we've done things God's way. We've surrendered our agenda, our will, and we said, God, whatever you want. And we've experienced the fruit and the blessing that comes with that, yet we still go back to our own way. But this is the gist of David's prayer, surrendering to God, submitting to God, acknowledging that, man, all the good in my life is made possible because of God and trusting God and doing things God's way. And this meditation is level-headed in a way that his reaction in the previous story wasn't. 
He's journaling and meditating on these ideas as a way of helping himself exit his addiction. And step 11 in recovery is seek through prayer and meditation to improve your conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for you and the power to carry that out. And this is about, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. When we pray God's way, we move from a self-centered perspective to a soul-centered perspective. When we pray God's way, we move from a self-centered perspective to a soul-centered perspective. See, most of us, we pray as a way of grasping for control, not giving God control. This is why not all the people who pray seem to be experiencing the power with prayer. Right? Even most Christians appear to think that the point of prayer is to talk to God so that he will give you what you want. But that's misunderstanding of prayer and God. Right? I, I, I see this in how I pray for my son. I don't pray for my son in ways of like, God, would you give my son, would you do in my life uh, what you will for my son? No, what I'm praying for my son is, God, would you just give him the supernatural ability to be great at sports, to be hyper-competitive? Would you allow his bone structure to just continue to develop and grow, be healthy? Would you make him super fast? Would you make him jump high? Right, that's praying for control over what I want, not what God wants. Right, but many of us, if we're honest, that's how we pray. Right, but the Bible, it frames prayer as a way to widen our view, to see God's perspective, and to help us understand our desires, our impulses, and his will for our lives. Most people have not been taught to pray this way. This is why the disciples in Luke chapter 11, they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. They saw Jesus praying and they said, oh, he is praying differently than we are. He is experiencing something that we aren't experiencing. And so he teaches them to pray. It's the Lord's prayer. And can I tell you, there is really not a whole lot that is really in it for us in the Lord's Prayer. It's really about directing our attention and surrendering everything about us to God and saying, God, I want your way above my way. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And that's how Jesus prayed. And can I tell you what David learned, what David started to understand is to pray that way. David prayed much like Jesus taught the disciples to pray. And this contemplative prayer helps you and I slow down, zoom out, gather God's thoughts. Not, not our thoughts, not our perspective, but to gather God's thoughts, God's perspective, as opposed to just simply impulsively acting on our own. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Prayer is not about changing God, but becoming willing to let God change us. Prayer is not about changing God but becoming willing to let God change us. And this is what David is recorded doing in much of the Psalms, and it has a profound effect on him. His worldview changes. His addictive cycle changes. And later, while he's still on the run from Saul, David stumbles onto his camp unnoticed. And look at what happens. First Samuel 26, 7 through 9, it says this. So David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. Verse eight, God has surely handed your enemy over to you this time. Abishai whispered to David, let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't need to strike twice. How many of us got that friend? How many of us got that friend that is encouraging you to do the thing that you don't wanna do? Right? They're like, oh, oh, come on, man, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. That's what's happening with David. Look at what David says, though, verse 9. He says, no, don't kill him. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? This is the same guy who earlier, after being insulted by Nabal, told his men, hey, get your swords. Let's go. This is the same guy who because he wanted to marry the princess, said, you know what, I'll go kill these men, I'll bring you back their foreskins. This is the same guy. And he says no to killing the guy who has been chasing him and been trying to kill him. And so if David's addiction was powering up and taking what he wanted by force, he's not indulging in it here. And maybe when it's given to him on a silver platter, this is evidence of his recovery. It demonstrates growth. And the reason he gives is consistent with the kind of thinking that occurs to you during contemplative prayer, like what we see in the Psalms. 
David was experiencing some level of freedom as a result, and it felt good. I guarantee you that David felt better. It was benefiting the people around him, and I'm sure David told himself, I'm never going back to that. And he meant it. And he didn't go back to it until he did. If we were to continue reading David's story, we see in the book of 2 Samuel that David commits adultery with a woman named Bathsheba and then arranges for her husband to be killed in a battle. And this is a relapse because most people in recovery relapse at some point. And so David powers up and he takes what he wants by force. And like most of us, when we relapse with the thing that has more control over us than we do it, David went bigger with his addiction than he did before. And this is how we think. We say, well, I screwed up. I might as well go all in. How does this happen? It happens when we stop doing what we did in the first place to get free. This is why step 10 in recovery tells us to continue to take personal inventory. And when you are wrong, promptly admit it. See, when we don't have any rhythms for contemplation, we become neurotic, exhausted, and angry attempting to calculate and control what's too big for us to handle on our own. Essentially, we start to play God rather than trusting God. And when that blows up, we cope, and it never works out well. But what David knew, but seemed to have forgotten as Deshaun comes back to join me, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Here's our big idea today. We can't eliminate our addictions overnight. We must manage them every day. We can't eliminate our addictions overnight. We must manage them every day. Recovery isn't something that's one and done. It's a path that we walk down and we work on continuously. It's the process of receiving and utilizing the grace necessary to manage the splinter that you wish you could pull out, but you can't. And this is why the writer of Hebrews 12, a passage that we've revisited throughout this whole series, he says this, 12 through 13, it says this, take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. It tells me someone who has been fighting something that they are struggling with. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. What I love about this is um, there's a word that's found in the Bible, a Hebrew word called darash. And that Hebrew word translates to the English, English language as to wear out a path. And what, when we see this in the Bible, we see this word in the Bible, this Hebrew word in the Bible. What it speaks to is the understanding that there will be seasons where God will feel close and there will be seasons where God feels distant. But if you derash, if you wear out a path, you know where to find him. Because you won't need to see where you're going, you can feel where you're going because you've worn out a path that feels different than the rest of the ground you're putting your feet on. Imagine just pacing back and forth, just pacing back and forth. And over time, if you're walking on dirt or soil, there's just gonna be a path that starts to get created. And can I tell you what happens when we do the things that help us experience freedom and we do them continuously, it helps us do what the writer in Hebrews 12 tells us to do, to, hey, wear out a path so that those who are weak and lame can become strong. It's not just about your freedom, but it's about the path that you're wearing out for you and other people may come alongside of you and they may need the same path that you've worn out to experience freedom. And so as you continue to just do all the things that are gonna help you get free, there's gonna be a season where you know what? You relapse like David did. And you know what you can do? If you've worn out that path, you can go right back to that path, regardless of whether you can see it or not because you can feel it. It's different on this ground. And so I'm gonna keep going because I know this is the place where I got free, right? Many of us, we don't experience freedom because we're just not willing to do the things that God has put in front of us to do. And so that's what we want to challenge you to do. Think of the things that you're doing where you've experienced freedom from the thing that has had control over your heart, over your mind, over your soul, and continue to do them. It's not rocket science, right? If I want to continue to be physically healthy, I got to continue to go to the gym. As much as I don't want to wear out that path, I got to keep doing it. Right, as much as I'm not looking forward to seeing Josh, who's my trainer, at 11 a.m. tomorrow, can I tell you, I'm not looking forward to it. But I know it's the path. I'm not looking forward to it at all. And if he pulls out that sled, I'm definitely not looking forward to it. 
right? But I know what I'm doing is I'm wearing out a path, right? If, if you know that you need to get to a 12-step program, that's what you need. Can I tell you, maybe that's where you start wearing your path, right? And can I tell you, when you get to the end of the 12-step program, it doesn't mean that you're done. Maybe now you become a leader because you still need to be around it. You need to now bring other people on the path that you've been wearing out so that they can experience freedom and so that you can continue to experience freedom, right? Maybe for you it's, you know what? I actually need to see a therapist. I need to see a counselor. And it's not because I'm not good. It's because I'm actually good. I'm good and I still need to see one because I know I got to continue to wear the path. Right? Many of us think when we get to a healthy season emotionally or mentally, oh, I no longer need the counselor. I no longer need the therapist. Could I tell you that maybe that's the most important point at which you need to see the therapist or the counselor? Why? So you can continue to wear the path. Tired hands, weak knees. You know what that tells me? There are going to be moments where that thing comes back and it maybe knocks you down. Right? It maybe knocks you down. Your, your knees are weak. Your hands are tired. But you know what you got. You got the path that you wore out. I can feel the difference on this path than this ground with my knees. Even though they're tired, even though they're weak, even though my hands are tired, you know what I can feel with my hands? I can feel that the ground is different where I've experienced the freedom from the things that have hold me back from experiencing the fullness of God. As long as I keep wearing the path, I can be free. But you got to wear the path. Because there will be some seasons in your life where you can't see. There will be some seasons where it's dark and it's cold and it feels like God is so far. But if you know where that path is, can I tell you, you will find freedom. But you got to wear the path. Can I pray for us? Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. And God, I pray, God, you know... You know the things in this room that have more control over us than we do it. And I pray that you would help us to get honest and real and vulnerable, not just with you, but with the people that we trust, the people that we feel safe with in our life, because I believe that's the first step in starting to wear our path towards freedom, to Darash. And so, Father, I pray, would you give us the courage and the boldness to get honest and to get real, and as we get honest and open with you and with those that we trust in our life, I pray that you then give us the boldness to take the steps necessary to continue to wear the path. The path that we know, regardless of what's going on, I know this ground feels different. I know where it leads. Would you help us? Father, as we wrap up this series, as we wrap up today, Thank you for your grace that is sufficient in every season, every circumstance. And may we not lose sight that freedom is not possible without you. We love you. We bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and Abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to to 84321. 
one. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.